So let me address the, ele- the elephant in the room. Uh, so we're doing a fight flick on Mother's Day weekend at Church by the Glades. <laughs> And you might wonder, is that a good fit? Now, if you're new, we're in this theme, this series called Back to the Movies. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, the tech team, video team's done a great job. Our musicians, give it up for all our talented folks at your campus. Great experience live or online. But let me kind of tackle that question. So actually, I think Creed, a fight movie, is the perfect movie for Mother's Day weekend. I, I, I know most preachers will preach a sermon about how God made the butterflies and hummingbirds and moms are awesome. But I think this one fits because Creed, Creed has been raised by a strong, smart, single, widowed, adoptive mother. That ticks a lot of mom boxes right there. But again, if you're resisting this or think it's a surprising choice, you're not alone. Part of our creative team, someone said, you know, shouldn't we pastor do his Mother's Day? Shouldn't we do like a cute movie, like maybe a Disney movie? We should do like a Disney movie. We're going to do a Disney movie next week. I mean, we've got fun stuff coming up next week. It's Pirates of the Caribbean's next week coming up. That's going to be fun. And we got, uh, ra- uh, we got Rally coming up in two weeks. Rally's coming back in two weeks. Young adults and serve the city. But so we'll do a Disney movie next week. I love a good Disney movie. But Disney movies are a terrible idea for Mother's Day. Disney's tough on mothers. You ever notice that? Think about how moms fare in Disney movies. They don't do so well. Uh, Bambi's mom, dead. Nemo's mom, dead. And that's just the start of the list. I mean, uh, Belle's mother, Snow White's mother, Cinderella's mother, dead, dead, dead. Princess Jasmine, we see the father, no mother, dead. Pocahontas, mother, dead. Ariel, Lilo, Aladdin, Tarzan. Princesses Anna and Elsa, dead moms. Mowgli from the Jungle Book. Even Remy the Rat from Ratatouille has a dad. Mom, I guess cat got mom, right? So <laughs> Disney is tough on mom. So, so no Disney movies on Mother's Day weekend. Even the movie for next week, Pirates of the Caribbean. By the way, I love the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. They're a lot of fun. And, and so don't miss next week. It's going to be just really kind of silly next week. A lot of fun. Channel your inner pirate. Come to Church by the Glades. Uh, but even the main characters in that movie, uh, their mom's all dead, all dead. Uh, Elizabeth Swan, we see her father. Mom's gone. Will Turner, parents are dead. Uh, Captain Jack, we meet his father. Keith Richards plays his father, by the way. Mom's dead. No Disney movies on Mother's Day. And, and then finally, I would say this. Here's, here's, here's why it really fits. A good mom, and I, I pray God bless you with a good mom. If not, listen, thanks for being here. Uh, I love the church. The church provides family for people who have messy families. But a good mom wears many hats. A good mom is a caregiver. She's a nurturer. She's an educator. She's a source of wise counsel. A good mom, boo-boo kisser, all those things, right? But a good mom's a fighter. A good mom is passionate and protective. You don't believe me. Meet Lisa Hughes, meet my wife, meet her, man. She's kind, she's charming, but you cross her kids, she will cut you. (laughs) My mom is watching online in Georgia. Happy Mother's Day, mom. And my mom is a godly lady. She will pray for you. She'll bake you the best uh, pecan pie. Yeah, give her to my mom. Go, mom. Yeah, mom. Happy Mother's Day. I miss you. She'll bake you the best pecan pie if you're sick, but you miss with me or my siblings, she will take you out. She's from West Virginia, man. They do feuds in West Virginia. You mess with the family. So uh, I think it's actually a fit. Now, as we kind of drill down on the movie Creed, Adonis Johnson, the protagonist, uh, he chooses to fight. He chooses to fight. Most fighters have to fight. Whether a real fighter or a fictional fighter, typically fighters come from marginalized backgrounds. I mean, they fight because it's one of the few vocational options open to them. So they're from a middle class working neighborhood or typically from poverty, and they fight to have a better life. But Adonis Johnson has a good job, works in an office. He's white collar, probably has a great education, makes good money. He chooses to fight. Why does he fight? He fights because fighting is in his blood. You see, Adonis Johnson is the son of the heavyweight champ, Apollo Creed. He's a fighter. There's someone else I want to talk about today. When you think of this extraordinary individual, you think of qualities like this. You think about his love. You think about his kindness, you think about his compassion, you think about his mercy, you think about his sacrifice, you think about his immense wisdom. But when you think Jesus Christ, do you think fighter? Do you think fighter? 
You probably should if you don't. I would argue Jesus is also a fighter. He is a passionate protector for his people. Let me show you in the Word of God. Let's quickly jump in the Word of God. Find your Bibles. Open up your Bibles. Turn on your Bibles. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to do a little verse by verse quickly. I'm going to jump right into this because i got so much to cover today. And you look like you are hungry and you're ready on this weekend to devour God's Word. Amen? Amen? Put your hands together. Let's dig into God's Word. I'm going to start 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22 on the screen behind me. I've highlighted three words. Read them loudly. Paul's speaking about his, uh, his strategy to bring people to Christ, to share his faith, do evangelism. He says, I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means. Let's read it again. By all possible means I might save some. He's saying this. He's saying this. The stakes are so high. I'll do whatever it takes. Like people come to our church, maybe you're here for the first time, you're like, wow, this is different. This is different. Boxing ring, movie themes, right? This is not what churches normally do. I, I get that. We're a bit unique. Uh, this verse is a huge verse for Church by the Glades. It's one of the reasons why we do what we do. I get it. We're not your normal church. Now, we're very conservative as to our theology. We're very orthodox in our theology, but very unorthodox in our presentation and methodology. Why is that? We're an all possible means kind of church. What Paul is saying is, I'll do anything. I'll do anything it takes. I'll do anything short of sin to help one person find Christ. See, we do what we do here, all this stuff. I, I don't desire to be provocative or controversial. I'm not even wired that way. That's people that know me. I don't like those kind of things. But if the stakes are truly, church, if the stakes are truly heaven or hell, life or death, the church of Jesus Christ cannot afford the luxury of playing it safe. We're an all possible means kind of church. Now, again, I love a good why question. Why? So why? So David, why specifically a movie theme, a movie series? Most churches don't do things like that. And I get that. And I don't jam other churches. I love other churches, churches that do church like us and churches that do church very much unlike us. That's great. But why a movie? Okay. Great question. Let me show you the same verse, different translation. This time in the New Living Translation. Look at the way it's phrased here. I, I think this is so rich. It says, uh, Paul speaking, yes, I try to find common ground. I try to find common ground with everyone. All right, so Paul's saying as I want to engage people with spiritual truth, I begin by looking for a common ground. Common ground. I, so I do that too. That's what we're doing here. You, you're staring at me. Okay, I'll break it down this way. My brothers, ever just before you go to a social engagement with your wife, she gives you the talk. She gives you the talk, right? Gives you the talk. Say, listen, whatever you do, don't talk about certain things. Don't embarrass me. In fact, if she tells you to avoid subjects, she'll mention two subjects. Whatever you do, don't talk about politics or Because people get weird. People get defensive. People get, uh, it's awkward. Don't talk about politics or religion. Ever think about my job? <laughs> Every weekend, I got to talk about what? Religion. Really, I talk, about, I talk about the subject. A lot of people are phobic or weird or awkward. So listen, I start with common ground. I start with common ground. Before we jump in, some of y'all would be just fine if I did a deep dive into heavy doctrine or the scripture right from the first word. But other people need to warm up a little bit. So let's find some common ground. Let's talk about a movie. Let's talk about, have you seen Creed? Yes, I saw Creed. I like that movie. That's a great movie. Uh, no, I didn't see that movie. Uh, the music. We, do some, we don't just do church music, worship. We do some music music. I like that song. I don't like that. It starts, the, I'm looking for common ground to take people to the scripture. It's not a new technique. I ripped that off from the apostle Paul. So uh, our next series might be about music. Might be, we'll look for music to kind of build that bridge. That we have. Listen, that disarms people. They start to trust me. It, it, it's strategic. And by the way, it's interesting. When these guys finish doing their stuff, no, Mike, nobody's asleep in your family, right? Nobody, nobody's logging on, man. What they do makes it so good, makes church so inspiring, so powerful. I, I love what they do. But it comes from this verse. Quickly, I'll move through the rest of the passage. Verse 23, Paul again says, I do all this for the sake of the gospel, the good news of Christ. They might share its blessing. And then the illustrations, the illustrations, creativity as old as the Bible. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Get ready to read. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Training, right? I say three. Shout the word training. Ready? One, two, three. Training. Put the word training in the chat. Training. 
You want to win, you got to train. You got to train. I'll pick up now in, in verse 26, verse 26, verse 26 on the screen right now. That is why I run straight for the finish line. That is why I am like a all this, all this, man, straight from the Bible. Paul says, I'm a fighter. I'm like a boxer. Do you like to talk sports? Who's a sports fan? Who's a sports fan in the house? Come on. Come on. That's it? That's it? What do you do? Like, watch ballet? Come on. Yeah, yeah. Sports. I start every day with my coffee, my Bible, then I jump to Sports Center. That's what I do, right? It's my routine. I love sports. Paul recognized people in his world love sports. Now, Paul is a Jew. He's a Hebrew. Hebrew heritage was not really rich on sports, but he's trying to communicate the God truth that began as a Hebrew thing to the Greek and Roman world. The Greeks were sports obsessed. The Olympics were birthed in Greece, and boxing was one of the original Olympic sports. By the way, no gloves. Guys, they, they wrapped their hands and they'd put metal across their knuckles, like brass knuckles, man. It was brutal. But Paul talks sports, probably trying to connect with the brothers, right? He says, so I'm, I'm like a boxer. I'm like a, I look at this next part of the phrase. I, I am like a boxer who does not waste his punches. Now, your English translation might say, uh, I don't shadow box. I don't shadow box. I think actually that's an unfortunate translation because boxers will use the technique of shadow boxing. But the idea in the original Greek is it's a wasted punch. Right. But I might say, I'm beating the air. It means this, you're throwing, but you're not connecting. It means this, you're expending energy and effort, but it's not effective. You're sweating, but you're not successful. Your punch is not productive. Is that anybody? Anybody? You're working really hard. You're working, but what you're working at ain't working for you. Right. Got to rethink your strategy right there. Here, again, the overall topic, the context is sharing our faith, evangelism, trying to take the word of God and connecting with a, a, a world that needs it so bad. A lot of what we do some as Christians, we're just punching the air. We're, we're wasting, we're wasting. He says, I, I don't want to do that. And quickly, he continues. Such a great passage. Uh, verse 27 is right now on the screen. It says, I, I discipline. I discipline. Look at the language of athletics. Discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Look at the language, boxing and, and fighting and punching and winning. That's Jesus. That's my king. That's my savior. And that's our call. This message today is for soft Christians, for soft Christians for weak Christians, for frail Christians, for Christians, a gentle breeze will knock you out the box. This is for you. Now, as I talk about Jesus being a fighter, there is some pushback. I get it. Why is there pushback? Because if you're like me and you grew up in church, this is not the way Jesus was described. When you heard sermons about Jesus, what character qualities did the pastor focus on? Probably his mercy, his kindness, his grace, his love. By the way, those are all true, all true. But we're so heavy on that side, we miss the fact that he's a protector. In fact, when you envision Jesus, we think what Jesus looked like, and we don't know, there's no photos of Jesus in the Bible, right? When you think of him, what do you think of? You probably think of images like, we found these online. Here's some images of Jesus that some of us grew up with. That, that's when you think of Jesus, you got this sweet Jesus. You got a sweet Jesus with his feathered hair, right? His feathered hair, and his, you know, holding a little lamb or something. I, 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 weird Jesus pictures, man. That's what, that's what you see all the time. This is a, doesn't invoke strength. This is not a fighter. I mean, like, oh my gosh, Jesus, look at your complexion. What is your skincare regimen you use, right? <laughs> look at your silky hair. What kind of conditioner? I, no! Hey, you see these weird, Jesus with the waterfall or the lamb or precious moments or I don't even know what's going on in this one over here. <laughs> that little baby has a crown of thorns. That's like Jesus holding Jesus. It's weird. <laughs> Soft Jesus. Yes, he was loving, and yes, he was kind, and yes, he was forgiving, and yes, he was compassionate, yes, he was approachable. I mean, kids loved his company, but he's a fighter. Yes. You see, when John first saw him coming to be baptized, he said, behold the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God. But you jump to Revelation chapter four. In one verse, he's the Lamb of God. In the next verse, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah who conquered. He's the ultimate spiritual apex predator. He's the greatest spiritual fighter of all time. He's a righteous warrior. I know that's not the way you think of Jesus. Heck, read your Bible. 
Uh, read the account, if you will. Read the account in Luke chapter 4. Uh, when he goes back to his hometown of Nazareth and he preaches and they don't like his sermon. Hometown folks don't like his sermon. It's too assumptive. They think it's blasphemous. Isn't it funny? When you start to succeed, the people you grew up with won't celebrate your success. They'll resent your success. Yeah. Unless they surf the wake of your success. Unless they can use you, they might criticize you. And they, they actually want to assassinate him. They want to take him to the edge of a cliff and throw him off the side. And in one of the most BA moments in all the Bible, the Bible indicates that Jesus spins around in that crowd, the crowd that's trying to push him off a cliff, and he stares them down. What did they see in his glaze? In that glare, in that glaze, they saw what? A glimpse that he was God. What they saw in that moment was not the lamb, they saw the lion. And they part like Moses and the Red Sea and a murderous, malicious, mean-spirited mob melts away. He's a lion. He's a fighter. Jump to John chapter 18. Now the end of his ministry is in the garden praying with his disciples. And it says a squad of soldiers appear. I love delicious biblical details. It says they are armed with torches and weapons. No doubt authorized to use deadly force. Why it's a time of social uneasiness. Uh, Roman, Roman occupation, Jewish insurrection. It's not their first nighttime mission. When they emerge from the darkness, Jesus knows their agenda. And he speaks to them and says, what do you want? And the Bible says that there are armed professionals when the lion speaks, when he roars, they fall back and they fall to the ground. And only after he willingly presents his wrists, afraid to lock eyes with the lion, they put the shackles on him. You got this view of soft Jesus. Jesus wasn't soft, my brothers. What did he do for a living? What was his job? What was it? He was a carpenter. He was a construction worker. See these images where Jesus is five foot five, he's a pale, frail, blue-eyed, decap sipping white boy. That's not who he was. <laughs> Jesus is six foot three, 235 pounds. He has guns. He has shoulders. He has lats. He has hair on his back. He has a unibrow, <laughs> hipster beard, no neck. When Jesus died on that cross, the moment he breathed his last, hell erupts in a hellish celebration. Fireworks go off, the confetti camera, uh, uh, cannons explode, and they're popping the champagne. All the demons are high-fiving and chest bumping each other. We killed him. We took him out. But when Jesus breathed his last on earth, his next breath was at their gates. And when you think of Jesus... That's tender. Jesus had like a little cute little precious moment, tinker toy. No, no, Jesus, Terminator. Yeah. Jesus, resurrected, glorified, shows up at the gates of hell with a UFC MMA wheel kick, <laughs> takes down those hellish barriers forever and conquers the power of hell and sin yeah. and death. That's my king. Yeah. He's both. He's a lover and a fighter. He's a lion. He's the lion and the lamb. I love that. The lion and the lamb. He's too lamb-like to be just a lion and too lion-like to be just a lamb. <laughs> He's not balanced. I love my beautiful warrior king, my lover king, my battling king, my compassionate king. He's my beautiful bipolar savior. So Christian, you should be like Jesus. You should love and when the time is right, you should fight. You should fight. You should fight. And let me be your coach and help define your fight. Three ways you should fight. Really quickly, three ways. Take some notes on your phone. Take some notes on your phone. I'm going to stare at you. Get out your phone. Go ahead. Get out your phone right now. Get out your phone. Don't you log off. Don't you log off. Get out your phone. I'm watching in prison right now. Man, take some notes the best you can. Number one, fight for your future. Fight for your future. Fight for your future. We mentioned the first week of this whole conversation back Easter that God has a glorious purpose for your life, a divine destiny. Amen. Bible does not stutter about this. It's emphatic. Check out Jeremiah 29, 11 on the screen right now. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. His plan is powerful, pervasive, and personal. So God has this customized, unique plan for your life now. God has this plan but it's not fatalistic. Meaning this, it's not going to just happen because God is God and God's powerful and God is sovereign and we are puny by comparison. No, no, no. We get the privilege to proactively partner with God in his purpose. 
So by certain acts of faith and obedience, I facilitate and fuel God's purpose in my life. Conversely, by acts of disobedience and disbelief, uh, I can frustrate God's purpose in my life, forfeit God's purpose. So it won't just happen. I get to cooperate. I, I must be disciplined. Again, back to the language of the scripture here, the athlete. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 on the screen. Once again, what's it says? Everyone who competes in the games, the Olympic games, goes into strict Briefly, briefly, uh, a pastor friend of mine, Pastor Craig Groeschel, one of the greatest pastors, leaders ever in the history of our country, a uh, pastor's the largest church, has done a great job delineating. It's, it's more than semantics. Kind of when Christians use this word, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Trying versus training. When I say, I'm, I'm going to try. I should eat better. I should exercise more. I'm going to try. I should start this. I'm going to I'm gonna try to read my Bible. I'm going to try to blah, 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 blah. He says, in that language, we give ourselves an out. It's kind of a weak, it's intention without commitment. I'm going to try. Can I share a pet peeve? Can I share a pet peeve, please? Can I share a pet peeve? Th thank you, Lisa. Thank you. On Mother's Day, you're being so kind. I'm going to do it anyways. When I ask for that, guys, listen, I'm, a, I'm too cheap to pay for therapy. I just tell you all my issues. Here's the issue I have. Um, pet peeve is this. I invite someone to church by the glades, which I do religiously. And they say, you know, pastor, I'm, I, I know I should, I should be there. I'm going to try to come this weekend. Makes me nuts. So I'm thinking, well, if you try, it ain't hard. Really, it ain't hard. If you, you, if you try, right, it's, it's if you live in proximity, my guess is God's blessed you with a day off or part of a day off. God's also blessed you with a car. God's blessed you with probably AC in your car. God's probably blessed you with gasoline. That's a big deal these days. If you try, you'll, you'll make it every time, 100%. One of my favorite church members comes to this campus. She comes to the same service every week, doesn't, does not have a car. Has God blessed you with sneakers? By the way, she's not 16, in her 60s. She didn't live across the street in those apartments. She comes from miles away. She walks, sits in the same place every week, wow. rain or shine. <laughs> if you feel guilty right now, you probably should if you're just trying. <laughs> now, what do athletes do? What do champion athletes do? What do they do? They train. They don't train. Yeah, you think I'll win the championship? I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to go to the gym. I'm going to try to work out. I'm going to try. Try to eat clean. I'm going to try. No, no, no. When you hear the word training, what do you think? You think of ideas like what? Consistency, intensity, uh, accountability. Uh, you think of an action plan. You think of their rain or shine. You think of intensity. All those things come to mind, right? You think of a coach. Adonis Johnson wants to be a champion. So what's the first thing he does? He secures a coach. That's the language of training. So to secure God's purpose in your life, you just can't try. You got to train. You got to train. You got to be disciplined, right? Intense training, Paul says. By the way, the word there in Greek for intense is the word we get the word agony from. When it hurts, you don't quit. You stay with it. You partner with God to achieve and receive everything God wants to give you, his purpose in your life. So stop the trying stuff. A great theologian said one time, said, do or do not, there is no try. Whether that great theologian was Yoda from Star Wars, but it's correct. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. We get better like athletes, right? So every week, Church by the Glades is your gym. The Bible is your training manual. And I am your Rocky Balboa. I am your coach. I'll meet you here faithfully. We'll make you better, grow, improve, achieve your destiny. Number two, fight for your freedom. Fight for your freedom. When I say three, shout the word freedom. One, two, three. Freedom. That may be God's favorite word. Man, God, God loves to set people free. God wants to emancipate you holistically. Yeah. He's the great divine abolitionist. When the son has set you free, you are free indeed, indeed. Now at Calvary, stay with me theologians, at Calvary, that is where God secured through Christ your salvation. But the other thing Jesus did at the cross was he set you free. But listen, you were declared free. The spiritual reality is, Christian, you're free. But I know you have what? You have toxic habits and you have negative people and you have uh, critical environments in your life. So listen, you must join in the fight for your freedom. So question, who or what is keeping you in bondage? Who is your slave master? You'll probably need to fright, fight. I've found in my experience, no one who benefits from your bondage ever emancipates you willingly. You gotta fight for it. Yeah. You got to fight. 
We got to partner with God proactively. So you tackle that habit. You tackle that addiction. You go to celebrate recovery. You get people speaking into your life. You do the things. Verse 29 is, I di- verse 27, I discipline my body. Critical, critical. We're going to do this. We're going to partner in free. If you don't think there's conflict in the spiritual life, ever notice the geopolitical setting of the Bible? Where, where in the world, we're on the map that the Old and New Testaments play out their stories? Okay, it's not in Switzerland. If you're watching right now in Switzerland, Switzerland is beautiful. I've been there one time briefly. Beautiful. Man, the mountains are majestic. It's lush. It's green. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you're famous, Switzerland. You're, you're famous for uh, watches, and you're famous for cheese, and Switzerland is famous for neutrality. And with, you know, Europe breaking out into warfare about every two generations, right? It's probably a smart strategy to survive. So they're kind of like the referee. We're not going to fight. We're not going to fight. We're going to kind of be in the middle. We're going to be neutral. But there are no Bible stories in Switzerland. The Bible stories play out in the Holy Land, in the Middle East, the Levant, Palestine, Israel. Even some of those terms are charged. People get upset by those. Why? It's the most contested real estate historically on the planet. It's been more warfare and bloodshed in Israel and surrounding regions. Think about where it falls on the globe. It's that unique small place between Asia and Europe and North Africa and all the great empires that use it as a bloody crossroad, whether it's the Romans or the Greeks or the Babylonians and the Assyrians as they go to wage war on the Egyptians, a mighty Carthage. Then even the little nations around Israel. Israel's small. Israel's a small nation, but she is tiny and tough. Israel's a fighter. And all these negative nations want to wipe it off the map. And that is the place that God chose geographically to fight for our spiritual freedom. You got to be a fighter. Got to fight for your future. Got to wage a war for your freedom. Third and finally, and I'll shut up. You got to fight for your faith. Fight for your faith. Fight for your faith. Without faith, the scripture says, it's impossible to please God. Now, this is just a moment for someone that you're like, you know, Pastor David, uh, truth be told, faith is hard for me. Faith is hard for me. I don't do faith very well. I've been coming for a while. I just can't keep waiting for the warm, fuzzy faith feelings to hit. (laughs) Who told you faith was a feeling? Who told you faith is like this emotion? So your faith is like this weird, crazy thing that comes over you and compels you to do tough stuff you don't want to do. Faith is not emotional. Faith is volitional. Look what it says in Hebrews. I love the language in verse 11, chapter 1 on the screen behind me. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the... You got to read the word conviction with way more conviction, church. All right? We'll get a running start on that again. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the... Is it just me or does that word drip with intense sweat, effort? I mean, for me, that word has muscle and sinew. That is a strong word. So faith is about your decisions, not about your feelings. It's just doing the thing that God shows you that is next. So what we call that experience in the next room, best next step. So whether it's salvation or baptism or going to best next steps or serve the city or starting to tie, they're forgiving someone. Here's what faith is. Faith, you won't feel it. In fact, I found in my journey pretty much every time God calls me to do something new, I feel like doing the opposite. I feel like running. I feel afraid. I feel intimidated. Y'all staring at me like it's just me. What faith is, I say, God, this is what it says in your word to do, and you're calling me to do this. And I don't want to do this, but I want to be a man of faith. So here's what faith is I'm going to say a prayer, God, give me courage right now. And I spit, and here's faith. I take the step. You take the step of salvation. You take the step of baptism. You take the step of marriage. Congratulations, guys. Newlyweds in the front row. Um, you take the step. Begin to read your Bible, being faithful at church. You, you take the step. That's, that's faith. That's faith. That's faith. You just do the stuff. You put yourself in immersive environments like this religiously. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You fuel your faith and you doubt your doubts. Don't dwell on your doubts. Doubt your doubts. Dismiss your doubts. Take your doubts. You're captive. Feed your faith. 
step after step after step. Whether you feel it or know it doesn't matter. Don't be soft. Don't be a weak Christian. Just do this stuff. Now, I want to close with one last idea. I want you to fight for your faith. Fight for your faith. But I see a sad trend in our world, especially here in this country. I see a lot of Christians, angry Christians, fighting about faith. Hear me out. There's some major issues right now. Oh my gosh, there's some major issues that we're dealing with as, as a culture that, that are huge. And they're, by the way, they're biblical issues and we need to make our voices and our votes heard. At the same time, the Bible gives the Christian person, the person of faith, clear guidelines, actually regulations on how I express my opinion, no matter how passionately I feel them. It says in the Bible, when I speak, my conversation must be full of grace, full of grace. Shout the word grace. One, two, three. And then just season with salt. Just see, just a little bit of salt, right? Just a little bit of salt, a lot of grace. Have I lost anybody? A lot of grace, a little bit of salt. But I see so many salty Christians right now. And man, you're just angry all the time. And as you, you speak and as you accuse and as you condemn and as you post, you're fighting, just fighting all the time, fighting. It's like, it's like, man, this, by the way, this is for someone who liked this message way too much to this point. I'm coming for you right now. What you've done, what you've done is you get out your little boxing gloves, your little puny boxing gloves, because you're an angry Christian and the culture, you're worried about our culture, you're worried about the culture, you're worried about the politicians, right? And you feel like, look, man, the Christian faith is under attack. It's under attack, the Christian faith. Jesus, you're under attack. But don't worry, Jesus, I got you. I got you, right? I'm gonna protect you, Jesus. I'm gonna come after the culture, right? Because, man, they're messing. The, the liberals are messing things up, right? The media messing things up. I'll fight the media. I'll fight uh, the communists. They're fighting things. Uh, no, wait, wait. It's the capitalists over here. It's the far right. And Jesus is up in heaven going, um, y'all know I conquered the grave. As you're trying to defend me with your. Little puny gloves, Christian, you know, you know that, yeah, culture's broken. Culture is assaulting the Christian faith. Culture is coming after Jesus. It's been that way since, I don't know, Genesis chapter three. But I'm still here. So we got some issues right now. I'm not minimizing. We got some major issues, but we got to be smart, as gentle as doves and as shrewd as serpents. But you don't have to defend Jesus. He's like, look, look, if Nero or the Nazis could knock me out, the Democrats or the Republicans or the liberals not gonna knock me out, right? I don't need you swinging. I don't swing, especially if you're angry. If you're angry and you're name calling, right? And you're, you're being as mean as the opposition. I don't need, that's not how my people operate. I don't need you defending me. I'm just fine. I arose from the dead. I walked on the water. I fed the 5,000. I calmed the storm. I healed the lame. I opened blind eyes. I conquered the grave, sin, and death. I am the Lamb of God, but I'm also the Lion of the tribe of Judah who has conquered. So Christian, put down your puny gloves. I'm fine, because guess what? I'm gonna wrap up this whole thing someday just how and when I choose. I will come again, and this time, I'm not gonna come as a cute little baby or lammy. I'm gonna return with a lion's roar as a warrior king on a war horse in front of an angelic army. And on that day, I'll bring this whole broken world to conclusion. I'll wrap up human history. I'll come back that day. I won't look like those pictures. My face will shine like the sun, my feet like burning bronze. I'll hold seven churches in one hand and seven stars in the other. My voice like mighty waters. And on that day, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and even under the earth. And on that day, every voice will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. I am, Jesus said, the all time undisputed, unbeaten, undefeated, champion of heaven and earth, of time and space, of kingdoms and dominions. So instead of posting your angry post, speak truth in love. Instead of vilifying the other side, look for common ground to move forward. 
Instead of being so angry all the time, won't you love people? Instead of giving out your opinion, won't you give your money and your time and your energy to the marginalized and the hurt? They're big issues. We don't have to fight for Jesus. He fights for us. He fights for us. Let me pray for you. Church of the living God, may we hear the Savior's clarion call. Sometimes he's a lamb. He's meek. He's mild. He's loving. He's sacrificial. But other times, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah who has conquered. We hear his roar. We respond. So bless us with biblical balance, with spiritual and scriptural symmetry as we have discernment, as we deal with the issues of this day. And most importantly, we will fight for our freedom by making moves of faith today. We make this prayer in Jesus' name.